at like where you're at today with your gallery and you put it in perspective and you see like where, where you came from, um, does it make it easier for you to continue as far as with your goals? I know for myself, I always tripped off of prison because I felt like I was in the matrix. And I would see things they're doing here and it's like, to me, it's, I felt like I was part of a social experiment. And so when I got out, I had that detachment from society. I didn't watch no news. I didn't know the economy had, had collapsed. I was just happy to be out and I was making moves. And so I sometimes revert back to that when I feel myself getting pulled in to all the, the bullshit because at the end of the day, man, you gotta create your own reality. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what this is, you know? I, I, I believe, it, and, I, and I trained myself for it in prison, right? In prison, when I said, okay, I'm gonna write a book, I spent five years writing the dagger. I said, okay, I'm gonna learn to paint. I studied every artist, not just one, different styles, oils, this, whatever. Chose the one that I liked and then created my own style. And I spent years, man, mastering that. 10,000 hours, I got 30,000 hours. How about that, right? Instead of going for what they say is a master, I said, man, I gotta triple it, right? For us, for men who've been in prison, who've been through that, that, that tough road that led us there, whether it was poverty, addictions, hopelessness, whatever it might have been, right? There's always a moment where you can say no more. Mm -hmm. I did in prison. I became happy in prison, and I was in prison, right? And I had shit, a couple hundred off commissary. And that's what I've had to do since I've been out. Every time I go through something, I think back to eight years ago when I walked out of the half, when I walked out of Forest City, Arkansas with a $50 check and wearing, I had nothing. My wife left me, I had no money. I had nothing. I got to that halfway house with nothing. Now my boys came together and they raised me money and they got me a job and they gave me a car and they put me in an apartment. But when I walked out that door, man, I walked out with nothing. And now I'm sitting on Melrose, eight years later, free. So, we, we, you know, we cover a lot of topics, man, but one of the things um, our viewers are going to know is, you know, having perfected that counterfeit bill, I mean, you know, what denomination and what was it that actually led to you getting the, you know, 100, 100 and, you know, five, six months in federal prison for that particular um, crime? Well, for, for me, the, it started, of course, when I was young, learning the old ways, right? The, 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 the offset press, the plates, the inks, and then getting away from that. When I went down the first time, it was for uh, 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 commercial burglary. We broke into a jewelry place, got the jewelry, right? Did two, two and a half years from that. And from that moment, that's when I did state. And I said, man, I'm not ever gonna do a state crime again. I swear I said that, man, right? Because that state time was tough. Texas state time wasn't easy. And, uh, and when, when uh, I studied Bruce Lee and I had the Bruce Lee Jeet Kune Do book and I gave it to my celly when I left. And when I got out, it was the first thing I wanted to go get. So my girl, she went to, to the Barnes Noble over there and she bought one with a hundred. And they just pulled out a pen and marked it and then threw it in the drawer. They didn't even look at it. And I said, I said, what's this, man? What, what's going on with this? <laughs> oh, well, that's the new money that came out. And right away, poof, I shot back to when I was young. And I'm thinking to myself, whoa, wait a minute, man. If they ain't even looking at the money no more, this is a perfect time to, to go back to this, you know? And then at that time, they had uh, uh, laser printers were new, right? So laser printers, print, uh, inkjet printers just came out and they were really good. In the early days, those first inkjets and first lasers were good equipment because they had no bugs in them, right? Mm. You know, they had no secret service software in them and shit, you know what I'm saying? Like, which I think they put in there because of me, man, you know? But it, they were clean and they worked well. And so I went on this journey, man, to t figure out how to, you know, defeat this. And the first thing, of course, was the paper, right? Because I needed to figure out how to make it mark because mm -hmm. that's all people did. And so I said, they did it to 20s, they did it to 50s, they did it to 100, they did everything. If you could figure out how to make it mark, man, it's, you're, that's golden, man, you're gonna kill it. 
And it wasn't that easy, though, man. We, we ordered paper from all over the world, seriously, man. All over the world, I had a pen. That back day, you didn't have to do internet like you had. They, so you had the yellow pages. You had to dump through the yellow pages of yeah. this paper company, and then they'd give you the name of the paper company in Canada, and that Canada pick. It was insane, man. And But we finally, you know, she finally went crazy on me. I snapped on her. She's, you know, going crazy with the phone book at me. I've called every place in the phone book, there ain't nothing out. And she threw the phone book down and she marked the phone book out of frustration and the son of a bitch marked. It marked, it marked yellow. We've been looking for all this paper, man, <laughs> from all over the world and the whole time it was in the freaking phone book. If you take a phone book, mark it, it marks it right, right? But the, the, now the next thing was getting that paper. So we ended up getting it from this company out of Canada. And, they, you know, I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to order some paper. Big, no big deal, right? They sent me a big ass roll. It was like two tons. What the hell am I going to do with two ton roll of paper? Man? You know what I'm saying? I literally, I'm not even kidding, man. I had them. I, I had a pickup truck. There was no way it was going in the pickup truck. So I jumped out of the pickup truck with a razor blade and I literally started cutting the, the oh. paper right on the dock. The dude's freaking out. What are you doing, man? You can't do that here. I said, man, and I'm just cutting the paper, man. And it's popping. And I'm put it was it was the nuttiest thing ever. But here's the thing. No one was printing money. Yeah. Right? So he wasn't thinking I'm gonna go print money with this shit. He did just probably thought I was some whack job, you know? But what do you know? Not only did the paper mark, but it was so thin that when you put them together, you could put the, the watermark and the strip in between, you know? And so I ended up getting a magnetic printer, we'd, so we'd pr print the, the strip and, and magnetism, all kind of spray them down with uh, uh, UV, uh, like an acetone-based spray to make it glow underneath UV light, like all kinds of weird little things. I mean, this took a time, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would, we went back to the old offset method, you know? And the reason I did that is because the, the printer, the lasers and the inkjets at the time, they couldn't get the color of money right. Mm, right, that cream off. green yeah. it's always off right like right, so the only thing i ended up using those 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 printers for the lasers and the, and the ink jets were for the seal and for the numbers that was it you know i used the offset for everything else for the background color for the weave and the, the face because I, I could take my own pictures of the money and get rid of the more so if you try to scan 100 it gets real weird around the head so the mm -hmm. only way you could avoid that is just print it yourself, make your own color. And then I could match the colors perfect, weigh the colors out. So, I mean, it took, this was a process, so this didn't happen overnight, you know. But when we finished, it was, it was unbelievable, right? It was, it was, I think the biggest, that's when I got nerve. So there was a time, I don't get scared, I don't fear shit, but I do, I get cautious, I say that. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little paranoid. Get right. that gut feeling. Yeah, and so when I when we were like when you're in the process of creating, even when I do a painting, I'm not thinking about really nothing except just I got to get this done. I got to make this thing badass, and that's how I was when I was going through this whole process of creating this build. There wasn't even a thought of spending it. There wasn't the thought of selling it. There wasn't the thought of a car. There wasn't the thought of a house. I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm gonna go print my own money. I'm gonna go buy a big ass. The only thought I had was making it the best. That was it. Mm. That was it. That was the laser focus, man. Then when we finished, when it came to an end and you came off the high of just going, trying to create for the last year or whatever, and you pull it off and you finish it, that's when the caution and the paranoia says, so, oh, fuck, what I just do? Right? Like, it's almost like you're, you're, you're messing around in your kitchen, you create a nuclear bomb, and you're like, oh, <laughs> shit, this thing blows yeah. up. I'm done, man. Yeah. We're, all, we're all gone, man, right? So. That's how I felt like, damn, what did I just do? The CIA is going to kill me. The FBI is going to kill me. I'm thinking everyone's going to kill me now. They ain't going to let me get away with this. Some cat from the projects outside of Chicago just figured out how to make money that could go through banks and things and had all the security systems. They spent hundreds of millions to make, and I just did it out of the kitchen, kitchen mm. closet, you know, with just ingredient, car paint that changed colors, house of color, directory paper. I mean, come on, one color press that that I would just make sure the registration was right so I could keep running it through. So I just looked at the, I went to the Secret Service site that was, oh, at that time he had government sites and shit that were working, hospital sites and stuff. And I went to the Secret Service site and, and they showed me how they layered their money. So rather than trying to print the piece all at one time, which is what made it look like shit, I said, I'm gonna just print it like the, like the feds. 
I'm going to print the, print, print the seal one at a time. I'm going to print the numbers mm. one at a time. I'm going to print the color of the money one at a time. I'm going to print the, 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 the border and the face one at a time. I did one, and I just made sure my registration was perfect like I do with my art. A lot of this art is a lot of registration people don't even know. Where there's hundreds, those hundreds were there purposely put in a certain place so I could paint and the image would come out perfectly. Nobody knows it about my art really, mm. right? They think, oh, it's a, there must be a complete print. No, I print too, but then I might just print a blank canvas with just hundreds in a certain place and then I paint around it. It's the dope, it's the funnest thing I do. When I'm hearing you tell this story, it reminds me of a, a classic movie I watched um, when I was a kid, man, uh, Live and Die in L.A. Live and die in L.A. There's yeah, a piece right yeah. there, dog. William Conqueror. Defoe. Yeah, yep. yeah, William Defoe. Yeah. yeah, man. I mean, and he was killing he was, it. He was oh, killing it, yeah, right? man. Slanging paper. And so for me, it was the same thing, man. You know, it just, when we finally got it, you know, my first thing was, was um, secrecy. It was so important. So I got super paranoid. I started hitting all the spy shops, you know, wherever there, you know, there was PIs looking for cheating husbands, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> there's always a spy shop yeah, in every yeah. town where the low-life PIs go, you know the what I'm saying? Counter shit, yeah. counter Oh, I had thing. all kinds of counter surveillance shit, man. You know, I was, and then my friend in Chicago, he worked for the FBI, he made all their little gadgets, so he'd give me all kinds of really cool shit. So I literally was like James Bond with that shit. That's why I do my Bond girls. Yeah. Yeah, man, I was wild with the, 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 the cameras and, I would bug people just to see if they were like snitches. Like I was weird, man. I was weird, I was weird. You know, just super paranoid. But I was printing money, yeah. that was real, you know? Yeah. You know, so like, you know, at the, at the, when we finally figured out, when we finally got the paper, when we finally got the colors, when we finally got the images, when we finally got it together, there was that level of caution, that paranoia, that like, oh shit, what I do? And then there was that excitement, like, hell yeah, I did it, let's go have fun. And me and my wife, at that, at that time, she was just my girl, Natalie, but we hit the road, man. And we started at first buying, you know, we'd, we'd get the old rabbit and now and that. Nobody knows what that shit is anymore, man. Mm. But, you know, and we'd hit the back roads to the towns that were like 100,000 pop. They'd always have a little mall. We'd go through one, she'd go through one side, have a wig on, have her thing on. She'd just hit all the stores. Boom, 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 boom. At first, we got stuff for us, right? But then you start having so much shit, and you're like, you can't even really buy yourself anything. It doesn't even feel good anymore when you buy yourself <laughs> things, right? Like, you really. bought, it, bought everything. Yeah, you know, and then you start buying things for your peeps. Yeah. And then you realize, well, damn, they don't even appreciate it, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, now they want everything, right? Once you get start giving it to them, then they're like, hey, man, next time y'all can you get me this and this and that, they're giving me lists. <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah. You know? And then so... That's when we said, you know what, man, let's just, because every, every town has a Salvation Army box in it. Pretty much every town has a charity box in it. And so that's when we just started saying, you know what, let's just buy things for kids, because I grew up poor. And so that's when we went on a rampage, man. Like, we went on a rampage. We must, I, if we didn't spend a half a million dollars on kids that year, mm. we didn't spend. She'd always get like 10, 20, $30 thing, get 70 chains back. She'd hit all the stores, get diapers or, or shoes or socks or clothes or toys. Or, it was always kids stuff though. We'd have a trunk full of stuff, drop it at Salvation Army, hit the next town. We'd even go to church on Sunday and I'd get 10% to the church. I swear to God I did man. I hope Lord don't get mad at me for that one. <laughs> but I did though. We'd go to wow. church, man, and I'd take 10% out and give it to whatever church we were at. I went to a drug class and they said that was like to justify what I was doing, but really I felt good about giving back to the kids. It was a good feeling. Even now, I still do it with Arnold Schwarzenegger's people, you know? Mm. We raise money for kids for the after school all stars. It's a great feeling, you know? And uh, so that's how it all started, man. And then where it, went, where it went wrong for me is when I allowed the cat out the bag, you know? Because when we were just keeping it, just going and doing our thing and traveling. And, and I was a big hiker, so we always ended up in the north, Northwest, you know, California, Mount Shasta, California. We, came. we always, you know, stayed in this area because I love the mountains and I love hiking. I love whitewater rafting. So that's what we did, young kids, spending money and just enjoying nature, you know? 
it's when I went back to Chicago because I had left. I hadn't been in Chicago for almost nine years at that point. When I finally went back, mm. I was almost, you know, 29, 28, you know. And when I went back, now all my friends that I grew up with in the neighborhood, like Horse, he was with the, the cats from Chinatown, heavy cats, right? My boy, Mikey and Georgie, you know, they were wrapped up. Mikey was collecting now for, 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 for the guys, you know. So like now all my guys I was playing basketball and grew up, they were all in like organized crime shit, man. You know what I'm saying? My boys from Pilsen, because I played basketball. Mm -hmm. So I'd go Pilsen, play ball. I'd go to, you know, Southside, play ball. It was CYC, Chicago Youth Center. So we'd go to all the neighborhoods. And where a lot of neighborhoods are segregated and they hate each other, I'd get cool with the other team. At least like one dude on it. Whether he was black, Ukrainian, Russian, Chinese, horse was Chinese. Black Rob, of course, Black Rob, he's from <laughs> 43rd, right? I'd be the only dude, white dude on 43rd Indiana, bro. Only white dude, right? A lot over there, you know? So I had a lot of privileges as, as far as the streets were concerned because I had good relationships with people in that area, whereas no one else would do that. I, I, I like my, my boys on 43rd Indiana, man. You know, I like my going and hanging out with my amigos over in Pilsen, you know? Like that was my, that, and, and then they became big time people, right, on the streets. And so my money just kind of started floating right through them. And I trusted them. But then it turned into a different animal. Right? Oh, once that element got involved? Yeah. Because if you're, at first it was pure, right? It's just two people creating, living life, giving. And then the criminal element jumped into it, and then it all changed. It all changed. And it did they know down. it was you, or did you make it seem like it was somebody else? Oh, no, my boys knew it was me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, but not many did, though, you know? I always drove a cop car, right? But a nice one, not like one of these shit when you see on the street, <laughs> but like a really nice yeah. one. I have a cop, cop radio, right? Like, I had secret compartments so I could stuff money in. Like, crazy shit, man. Like, I was straight just nuts with it, you know? Mm. But I always had a cop car. And, you know, because I'm white with glasses, man, they thought I was a cop all the time. Yeah. That was one good thing, man. You know what I'm saying? There truly is racial profiling. They thought I was a cop. They racial profiled They see the me. car, didn't yeah. look at you. Didn't even look at me. Wave at me. State troopers wave at me. I'd have 100,000. Mm. Yeah, so that was that racial profile I'd get, you know, straight up. They thinking I'm a cop, man, you know? So I guess it had its advantages, you know? And I never got pulled over, you know, with shit. I never got caught with anything. It's always people's mouths, you know? So did they actually, did you get caught up on an ongoing investigation or was it one specific transaction that was it? Just that it was, was a few rap. things. The first time was I was doing a deal at the House of Blues. The bartender was a snitch for the cops. Oh. Heard me and my boy talking at the bar. We weren't even talking about money though. We were talking about, he had his friends in from Russia, his family. He was having a party at his house wanted me to come. They thought we were partying upstairs, kicked in the door, but I beat the case. But once I beat the case, it put the Secret Service on me. Took off to Alaska. My dad was a criminal, hadn't seen him in 22 years, finally see him, and he's growing pot underground, you know? Wanted me to get back into the money, and we ended up going to prison together, actually. Mm. Yeah, that was the, that was the next time. Yeah. His wife told on me, Again, didn't didn't catch me with nothing, yeah. you know. And uh, <clears throat> again, it was a small sentence. The bad thing about that, my dad died on the day I got out. Literally, he was in Sheridan, Oregon, feds, mm. and I was in Waseca, Minnesota. And so, on my release date, man, he 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 died of a heart attack. Wow. And then I got stuck with my 15-year-old son, whose mother actually was a Chicago police officer, man. Like, you can't write this shit, crazy, man. You know. And she didn't want him no more because he was trying to print money off her printer, trying to be like her, his dad, right, my 15-year-old. Actually, he was 13 at the time. And then so now I got, I'm raising this kid fresh out of prison. Didn't go well, you know. Got him into some music, started spending some money, and then I went back to counterfeiting again. Mm. But this time I was going big. I was, I was like, okay, if I'm going to do it, I'm doing it big. And I'm kind of glad what happened happened, you know? Because while I was getting ready to do something, my son was doing some bullshit at the house. That's how I got jammed up. I came home, him and his friend are printing money on his studio, because I had got him a studio. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I'm getting ready to do a big run. 
And now I see this kid printing 20s. His friend runs out the house, he runs out the house, I run out after him. Catch him on shields, man, we're arguing. He throws money at me, cops pass by. Oh, like in a damn movie. <sighs> Done. And because they, at that point, they were investigating me, they hit my shed, they hit my warehouse. But what they didn't know is three weeks prior, the old man Rick Benny had me clear it out because he sold the building. And they, they didn't move. They knew where it was at. They had a picture of me from the sky. It was the weirdest thing when you see a picture from your sky. Mm. And, and you know you're messing with some people, man, you know? And, and they, hit the, they hit the shed, it was nuts. I told the Secret Service, I said, man, there ain't nothing there. Oh, we got you now, you're going down. Because if you get caught with the equipment, man, it's game over, man. It's 25 years, you're not even, you know? And, uh, but I knew, man, I was like, man, we moved all that stuff out three weeks ago. I didn't tell him now, I'm thinking this, yeah, right? Yeah. And like, nah, man, we're going in. We got you finally. He's, he's, I mean, he's messing with me about it. My boys told me they had two helicopters and 22 agents, man. They hit the freaking warehouse and it was but empty, man. It was empty, dog. There was nothing in there. Nothing in there. Oh, you talk about a win. Oh, they were hot. Hot was the word for it. The next day, when they took me to court, man, the, the secret agent had my by the arm. He's like, oh, you think you're a funny guy, huh? And I said, hey, man, come on. You ain't got to hurt me, man. I told you. I said, just because I'm a criminal don't mean I'm a liar. I told you there was nothing in there. You didn't believe me. That's on you. And my boys, they told me, they said, Art, it was crazy. They had the SWAT team. They had the freaking helicopters with everything. And they went in there. And we thought you were done. We thought you were done. I said, no. No, nah, the old man made me move everything three <laughs> weeks before. Oh, shit. Yeah, luck. Pure luck, bro. I wouldn't be sitting here with you right now if that old wow. man would have done it. He's dead now, but thank you, Rick and Benny, man. Yeah. Cleared it out. And then he had people come in and clean. So it was super clean because he knew, you know. Yeah. He knew I was up to no good. You know what I'm saying? So like, he covered his ass. He covered his yeah. ass. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So when I'm talking about when they came in with forensic, there was nothing. Not even a fucking hair of paper. Mm. Nothing. Nothing. It was crazy. It was crazy. You know, but that was the sentence. I ended up getting out on bond. You know, things just weren't, things were a real mess. I was scared. I thought I was going to get killed. You know, all kind, you think all kinds of shit at that point, man, you know? Yeah, major paranoia. Major paranoia. And I actually wanted to go to jail. I didn't want to be out, man. You know, they you, probably let you out thinking they could try to. Well, that's what they were trying to do. Yeah. That's what they were trying yeah. to do, you know, and, and, and it didn't work, but it put me in a lot of danger, you know? I was in a lot of danger. And, and so when I got it, when I finally got, because I was on the run for 12 days, some cat owed me some money, and I was trying to get the money before I knew I was getting sentenced. And so I was trying to get the money before I went down, and I couldn't find them. And so I went ahead and missed my court date. And then it took me 12 days to find them. Secret Service were chasing me for 12 days while I'm trying to get my money, man. It's some mm. crazy shit, dog. But I got my money, and then I turned myself in. <laughs> I did. I got my money. Yeah. So they were leaving cards. The agents were leaving cards all around to all my friend's house. And so my one friend came to me, and he said, Art, listen, man, you got to either turn yourself in or get the fuck out the neighborhood because they're hitting all our houses, man. They're leaving these cards, man. So I went to 47th and Archer. There was a payphone on the corner. It was out of my neighborhood. It was like on West Chicago. And I called the agent, man. I said, listen, man. You know, you guys are hunting me, man. You can find me, man. Just, you got, you're going to get me killed. Keep going to these people, man. Well, we got to find you. We're going to keep doing what we got to do. Well, you know, I knew they're tracking me right now, right? Yeah, they're trying to get I it. said, look it, man. I just got one thing I got to do, and then I'm out of here. And then I'll come turn myself in. I said, I'm just asking you to back off just for a couple of days. We ain't backing off, right? The Seekers. I was like, all right, well, then whatever. And boom, I hung up on them. And uh, they were, man. They almost got me, too, because I, uh, my girl flew in from Texas because I finally got the money. Mm -hmm. So I wanted my girl to come get the money, take it back to Texas. So she flies in and I meet her at a hotel on, at Midway, right? Now I've been all over the news now. My attorney been talking shit, Rick Halpern, man. He was a mob attorney, probably get the footage, I don't know, man. <laughs> Some bitch was talking crazy about me, man, on the news. And I was on the news in the morning because I told my boy, I said, uh, I said, listen, if we're not on the news in the morning, then I'm cool, man. He said, you know, you're, you're right, Art, you're right. Man, 
12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, WG, and man, I was all, I was the first story, man. I'm like, he goes, nah, bro, it looks like we in trouble, man. You know what I'm saying? He goes, we in trouble, man. I'm like, oh, damn, man, this is not good. So she came up. I met her at the hotel on Midway. Now, I've dyed my hair now. Right, I look Mexican as hell. Right? <laughs> I got a black goatee, man. I've been doing suntan spray. Like, <laughs> crazy, man. The shit you'll do, man. Try to hide yourself, bro. You know what I'm saying? You'll get goofy as hell. And, uh, and so I thought I was cool. So we went to the restaurant, TGIS, and me and her are sitting there. And I tell her, I said, uh, I said, uh, I said, uh, I said, uh, we're sitting there eating. And I look over and I see the security for the hotel staring at me. And I know that a lot of these securities are off-duty cops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they get the beat. You yeah. Know? They get the warrant beat, right? So I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. And I'm like, and I could just feel in my gut. We're waiting for our food. We already ordered and everything. I said, listen, man, I'm going to get up and use the bathroom. And then I'm out the back door. And I need you to meet me in the parking lot. We got to get out of here now. What do you mean we didn't eat? I said, I don't give a shit, dude, staring at me. So I get up. I go out the back door. She gets up and leaves. He, 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 I, I come out the side, and our hotel's over here. So we start shooting across the parking lot. I hear cops. I hear everything. I'm like, man, they're coming. I knew they were coming, right? Bro, I tell you, by the grace of God, I don't know how it happened. I walked through the front door. of the, of, I told her, I said, go to the Dunkin' Donuts. Don't come in the hotel right now because they're going to be looking for two. She goes, sure. I said, run to the Dunkin' Donuts, get you some donuts and coffee, then come back over and go the round the long way. And so I walked right through the front door, and thank God, the lady, I walked soft as a motherfucker, man. I'm like a ghost when I walk, right? I used to be a cat burglar, man, when I was younger, man. So I still got this <laughs> shit, man. You know what I'm saying? I literally ghosted. She had her head down. She never wow. looked up. She never looked up. My room was on the very last one. I, I went to the room, got in there, locked the door. Bro, cops everywhere. They're everywhere, right? But she for sure told them, oh, I didn't see no one come in here. And there's no way in the world she would have said she did because she didn't see me. Yeah. Right? So in her mind, she would have heard someone come through. Yeah, there's no way you could have got past her. There's no way I could have got past her. And I knew this. I knew this. If that woman really did not look up, then in her mind, she will be convincing to the cops that she did not see me. And that's what happened. They did circle that parking lot. Natalie came in like 20 minutes later. She's like, oh my God, they're everywhere. There's a helicopter, they're all over. I said, they say anything to you? She said, no, they, I just walked right past them. It was the, uh, a Burbank police. I'm peeping out the window. I could see the Secret Service. They had, the fuck, they had everything locked down, right? And so they were just trying to see if I was gonna come out, slip. Mm. Well, I didn't slip, man. You might want to delete this, but I got my girl naked, and I said, if I'm going to jail, man, I'm going to go jail having fun, man. You know what I'm saying? And I said, they're going to kick in the door with my pants down, man. You know, and me and my girl, we had a great time for the next hour and a half while the cops were out there. It was insane. They ended up leaving. Her friend Sarah, like 5 in the morning, came up to the door. I slipped in the back. The back uh, they popped the door open, climbed in on the thing, drove away, got away, got away. Wow. Two days later, I turned myself in. So I did all that shit just to turn myself in. And when I turned myself in, I knew where the Secret Service building was downtown. Of course, I would know, right? You know what I'm saying? They probably wouldn't like that, knowing that I know. What did they say when they seen you walk in there? I walked, well, this was crazy. So I called, dude, the, the guy. We were right around the corner from the Secret Service building. It was on Canal and like uh, 11th, like right past Roosevelt, Wabash, right over there. So we're right next door, and I said, I call him. I'm like, hey, man, I'm turning myself in. He goes, when? Where? Where? I said, right now. What do you mean right now? I said, right now. He goes, you're turning yourself in right now? I said, yeah, man. I told you I was going to turn myself in once I figured out what I had to do. Well, where are you at? I said, oh, shit, right around the corner. What? And I got out of the car, gave my girl a hug, kissed her, walked up to the main entrance. As soon as I walked up, dude, there must have been 30 Secret Service. Mm. It was like a real movie, bro. They got, came up behind me. I put my hands out to him, and the one guy, it was the head of the Secret Service was there. He said, nah, we'll, we'll cuff you upstairs, man, because I turned myself in, so they had a respect for me. One thing I can say, man, that was kind of, when I look back at it all, the one agent, I don't know his name, Brian something, like he, he was a good man. 
Like he, 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 he hunted me in a manner that he hunted me, but then he respected me in a strange way too. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's because he had to get to know me to try to find me. And then he started seeing like, I'm just a kid from the street who just got wrapped up in something that allows me to survive. I wasn't a drug dealer. I wasn't hurting people. I wasn't, I was just, I wasn't even trying to get rich, man. I didn't even care about that. I just wanted freedom and security. That was it, you know? And he somehow got that because not only, not only did they not handcuff me, which was a trip. Now they handcuffed me upstairs, right? But they at least allowed me to get on the elevator, which was cool. Mm -hmm. Cause they could have tackled me and beat oh, the yeah, shit put out them, of me. Yeah. Like they could have done all things, but they were very respectful, which is mind boggling. Especially because you were on the run. Yeah, 12 days. But they took me upstairs, man. They had, you know, and then and I said, and they were they were cool about it, you know. I went and got sentenced, and uh, and again, even then at the sentencing, man, they were trying to up upcharge me, you know, uh, upgrade my points, you know, give me more points. And mm -hmm. They were trying to get the agents to testify against me that I was out of control, right? You know, the agents they'll usually show up, man. You know, if they're told to show up to testify, and he never did, you know, he never did. And, and they still gave me a lot of time, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then on the day that I got moved, he was dropping someone off. I don't know if it was planned or not. And he told me, he said, you know what that judge told you? It's true. You're too smart for this. I really do hope you take the time to get it together. The agent did. He came and while I was at MCC. He was dropping someone off. And he was right there. I said, it's kind of weird you're here today that I'm getting shipped out of here, huh? <laughs> right? He said, ah, you know, I had to bring guy over. I said, really? He said, yeah. He goes, you all right? I said, yeah, I'm all right. He goes, listen, man, you need to think about what, you, what your life is going to be, you know? So it was weird because I get mad at some of the government shit that goes on, the tyrannical shit. Mm -hmm. But then I look back at my situation, you know, and, and those people were, were real people too. They just had a job, you know? And, and they, and I've been treated by bad cops. They beat my leg, man, shouldn't be walking, right? But then in this scenario, they weren't bad, you know? They were just putting me away, putting me down. What do you know? think about the comment I heard somebody say, I think it was Kevin Gates, he said, you know, um, when I was in the streets doing what I did, my job was to not get caught. And the police's job was to catch me doing what I was doing. So he said, I can't get mad at them because they were doing what they were supposed to do and I was doing what I was supposed to do. That's what it is. You yeah. Know? You can't be mad about, you know, what the consequences are when you know that the consequences could lead to prison. I think that, I think for a long time, as one of those top tier criminals, you have this belief that you're untouchable, that this is going to last forever, that you're smarter than everyone because you got away with it so many times. When you, when you're, especially a person like me who break, was breaking the law every day, a hundred times a day, spending 100 is breaking the law. I would do that a hundred times a day. I had no fear of it. And when I lost the fear of it, there was a level of confidence that arose and a level of even ego, even ego, you know? And so, you know, and you have to have it in this too, though, right? You have to have some confidence in this art game. You know?